And then I'll post um, last week's conversation as well as this week's conversation. I'll try to get that up by Friday, okay? Um, so we had three points of inquiry in our breakout rooms. Um, the first one being, um, what is the concept of Sankofa? So one, define what Sankofa is and how does that apply to African history? Um, two, how does the information in this particular section on African history disrupt your current understandings of world history? And then finally, what stood out to you most about the reading? Um, who would like to share what was discussed in their breakout rooms? I would. Okay, go for it. Okay, so we were discussing, um, for, for me, um, the disruption was that I had mentioned that I took an um, anthropology course. Mm -hmm. And when we studied the omic civilization, I, I specifically asked my professor if these were of African descent. And he said, oh no, um, there's people who say that, but um, there's no evidence of it. So I went to New York um, just in December and they have like a big exhibit, they have the big Olmec head. And I was there with my friend and I was like, dude, there's no way that this is not, that they are not of African descent. So for me, it was what, what I read, it kind of was, to me, it was like, question two and three, what stood out the most is that you're not taught that the, that they were actual explorers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they were first here in the Americas, not as enslaved, but as explorers and, and to bring knowledge. And, and, and when I specifically asked that question, it was totally brushed off. So it, it, for me, it was like, Again, what we're taught in school, and this is like now, it's like two semesters ago. So it's not like if the knowledge is not there and the evidence is not there, it's just still suppressed, like it's still not being taught correctly. Um, Patricia, were you in last week's lecture? No, I missed it because I'm at work. Um, I, I, I don't want to sound repetitive for those who were in last week's lecture, but, but what you bring up was kind of discussed last week. And it, and it brought up for me this book here is titled um, They Came Before Columbus um, by Ivan Van Sertima. And this is an image of an Olmec head, Olmec head in the statues. Um, trying to see if I get it. Yeah, I have a picture with it. They have it in the New York Museum of History right now. Huge. And, and, and like yes. the, the, um, the, the, the facial features, very yes. broad noses, very thick and full lips. Um, in fact, Absolutely. Even yeah. at the uh, back of the old Mac head, so if you can see here, like, look at yeah. that nose. Uh, yes. Yeah. That's a black uh -huh. nose to And me. all the relics, they have, like, relics there. All the relics are are every every image. Yep. It's, it's the, like, I don't see how this is brushed off by so, and, and mainstream. There's two things at play, Patricia. Um, one, historically, anthropology is a very, very anti-Black and very racist discipline. It, it's, it's improved drastically over time, but especially when you talk about early anthropology, it, it's very, um, in fact, it was one of the science, the pseudosciences that was used to justify racism and to justify class, excuse me, um, cultural differences, right? So um, the idea of um, eugenics, right, where the size of someone's head determines their intelligence, a lot of that was supported by anthropology. So that's one of the things that's kind of going on within that discourse. And then two, um, one of the reasons that um, we kind of, kind of talked about also last week is, you know, it's the same reason that they don't want to say that Egypt or Kemet is a black society, right? Because to say that Kemet or Egypt is a black society, which is widely recognized as one of the first societies in the world, would kind of upend this whole idea that African people aren't human, right? So they have to like, it's kind of like, you know, like when, when you're a kid and your parents say, once you start lying, you got to keep lying to keep up the lie, right? right. That, that's what our history is. It's a lie that's been maintained for over 500 some odd years to kind of keep a certain group in power and keep a certain group out of power, right? So those are the kind of the, the things that play that add to that particular discourse. And, and, and you're absolutely right, Patricia. Um, the African presence in the Americas is not due to enslavement. And, and again, I hate to sound redundant to like uh, Mauricio and those who were here last week, right? But, but we know through this book that I showed you um, that the brother of Mansa Musa, Abu Bakr II, made his voyage to the Americas from Mali 
200 centuries, 200 years, excuse me, prior to Columbus making his voyage here to the Americas, right? right. Documented evidence. So you're right. The evidence there is all to support this truth, right? But we have to continue, well, not we, America and those that in power have to continue the lie to keep these positions of domination in place. Okay. Yeah. Who, yeah. Who else would like to share what was discussed in the breakout rooms? Can I share? Mm -hmm. Please. So what me and my uh, group members discuss in our breakout rooms is that Sankofa is the process of restoring and recovering the rich concepts and practices from African individuals throughout history. Mm -hmm. How it applies to African history is basically in within the discipline, they're trying to figure out the ways how Africans utilize medicine economics, politics, to further enhance the world. And hopefully these um, Black Studies scholars will use these concepts to enhance their societies in present time. Yeah. That is what we came up with. Yeah, I think that's spot on, Derek. I, I, honestly, I don't have anything more to add to what you said because I think you hit the nail on the head, right? Um, the only thing I wanna kind of add in, in a different way of looking at this, Sankofa is a temporal, symbol right does everyone understand when i when i mean what i mean when i say temporal does anybody need me to explain what temporal means further yes please yeah so temp so there's two things right you have temporal which signifies time right and then you have what's called like spatial which symbolizes space right so sankofa is a temporal symbol because it deals with what the past the present and the future right but it's not a linear temporal understanding, right? Because in the Western world, right, we understand time to work like this. You have your past, you have your present, and then you have the future to come, right? But in often in African societies, it's not linear, it can be circular. Or even the fact that the past, the present, and the future is all happening at one time, right? Um, has, let me, give me one second, I'm gonna pull up an image for you all. Help this idea of Sankofa make a little more sense. So if you notice, let me share my screen here. So can, can everyone see this, this image on the screen? The bird. Yes, the bird. OK, so if you notice, the bird is looking backwards, right? So that is to symbolize the past. And if you notice, the bird has like an egg in its mouth, right? The egg symbolizes the knowledge, the wisdom, the information. Right. But if you notice where the bird is situated, it's clearly moving forward. Right. So if he's looking towards the back, his body is going forward. So this idea, the temporalness of this idea is to look back to your past, to gather the knowledge from your past, allowing it to inform your present so you can move into your future. Right. And this bird symbolizes all of that in one symbol. And it also disrupts this linear notion or understanding of time, right? So this is this idea of Sankofa and how it pertains to African history. I think um, Derek said it, right? The scholars within the discipline are seeking to get the knowledge from the past to inform the future, to help African people move in, sorry, to inform their present, to help African people move into their future, right? Um, let's get one more comment about the breakout room and then I'll, I'll go into my notes. Anyone else want to share what was discussed in their breakout room? Uh, Francesca, what was discussed in your breakout room, if you don't mind sharing? Um, we, we discussed uh, what Sankofa means, which is a return to retrieve and recover. And then we also talked about the bird. And I think that's off as far as we got in our breakout room. Cool. Thank you, Francesca. All right. So I'm going to kind of go through the notes. I'm just kind of be pulling from certain sections of the text. Um, providing more details to those um, information to that information. Um, also, if you need me to stop to slow down to pause, don't hesitate to like stop me. Um, 
again, this is an exchange, right? It's not just about getting information from me. I'm also here to learn from you. Um, as you know, for hope, for those who have been in this um, before, I, I always start off with the opening, right? I think in any type of, any effective reader is going to be very attentive to how the passage starts, right? Because it's going to give you a lot of information. So I'll read the first paragraph and a half, and then we'll kind of move through. Um, so Black history is engaged here as the first field of study in the introduction to Black studies for several reasons, right? So they're saying that we have this concept of Black studies, right? We have the discipline of Black studies, which we covered um, last week, but this particular fraction of the discipline, African history is the first branch of study, right? And they said that there's multiple reasons as to why it's the first, but the first reason, and this emphasized the discipline stress on the interdiscipl interdisciplinary, um, sorry, interdisciplinability inter of the historical perspective, excuse me. So they want to emphasize the importance of understanding the past, right? So that's the first reason why African history is the first um, fraction of the discipline, right? You want to have a clear understanding of the historical perspective, right? And how that relates to our human reality and our human condition, right? So things that happened in the past have great, grasp, uh, great importance to how you're perceived in the present, right? Um, black studies is not equated with history, but it is considered an indispensable area of study in understanding the origins, development, and meaning of things, right? Says Malcolm X affirms that the centrality of history to the study of social reality in his statement that of all of our studies, history is best prepared to reward our research. So in all of our studies, history is best prepared to reward our research, right? So you can search um, science, right? You can search math, right? You can search sociology, but according to Malcolm, history is the science that would give you the best information, right? Secondly, beginning with black history stresses also the importance of ongoing project of historical recovery in every field in black studies. So, Remember last week I said that black study serves as a critique, right? We're gonna critique the things that we're going that are going on around us, and it serves as a corrective. So not only are we gonna critique the ills of Americanism, of Westernism, of capitalism, right? We're gonna to seek to correct those ills. And one of the ways of doing this is doing a historical corrective. And, and part of that historical corrective, you already heard play out in Patricia's dialogue. Right. See, I, I asked my anthropology professor, hmm, are these OMAC statues of African origin? And they said, nah, they're not. But we had to do a corrective and provide evidence through Black scholars that shows otherwise. Right. So, one, we could critique the fact that this anthropology professor and the discipline of anthropology, by and large, is lying. Right. But then we could correct that lie with accurate information. And this is the work of African history through the discipline of Black studies. Um, so this idea of recovery, right? This process is called Sankofa, and a con word. So when you hear a con, um, think the West Coast of Africa. Now um, a, a, the Akan region will be like Ghana, um, Senegal, all those countries along that region, OK? So it's an Akan word, which means to return and recover it. This involves returning to the rich resource of the African past or history and using it as a foundation to improve the present and enhance the future, right? Um, then he provides us with some definitions, right? He says that history is the struggle and record of humans in the process of humanizing the world, i.e. shaping it in their own image and interest. So let's stick with that for a moment, because I, I think there's a lot to, to be unpacked, right? It says history is the struggle and record of humans in the process of humanizing the world or shaping it in their own image and interest, right? And if you think back to the first week that we met in the class, and I asked you all, somebody named for me an African individual and their significance contributions prior to European contact, right? And, and we struggled with coming up with an African individual prior to European contact. But at the same time, if I were to ask you all, who is Plato? Who is Socrates, right? We know who those individuals are, right? Because Europeans have effectively humanized the world in their likeness with their understanding, right? 
It's a reason why Jesus looked the way that Jesus does, right? Because if you read Revelations, it'll tell you, and, I, and keep in mind, I'm not a Christian. I don't believe in the Bible. Let's just to bring an example, right? For those who do, correct me if I'm wrong, but in the Bible, in Revelations, it says that Jesus had feet of bronze and hair of wool, right? Now, to my understanding how wool works, wool don't lay down flat. That's not how I see no wool. I don't see sheep with straight hair, right? To me, bronze and alabaster are two vastly different colors, right? You know what, when I say alabaster, you know what that means, right? Whiteness, right? So how do we go from the Bible, the text that Christianity believes to be true, saying that Jesus looks one way, to worshiping an image that is antithetical of what the Bible says Jesus looks like? How does that happen? Because they use history to socialize and humanize it in their own likeness, right? Fuck with the truth say, I'm gonna make it look like me, right? Because I'm the world power. And once you begin to colonize the image of God, it's a direct way to colonize the mind and to colonize more importantly, the spirit, right? So this is the work that history does. And we must serve as a corrective to this false notion of history, right? Um, so let's go to the, I'm going a little bit further down, right? So he says, African or black history then is the struggle and record of Africans in the process of Africanizing the world, i.e. shaping their world in a particular way, right? This adds to the richness and the beauty of human diversity, and it contributes to the overall effort of humans to transform the way world in a way that improves the human condition and enhances the human future. So here, here, here's to me, it's a very clear distinction being drawn, right? If, if you're paying close attention to what he's, what he's saying, History has shaped the world in a, in a very specific form, right? History has shaped the world in, in, in a way that authenticates whiteness, right? But what African history does, seeks to do, yes, it's gonna speak to the Africanity in the historical condition, absolutely. But it's really about doing so in a way that's gonna improve the overall world, right? It's not just about improving the black condition, because if that's what he wanted, he would just say to improve the condition of black folks, right? But no, this reimagining of history, this corrective of history, it seeks to better and improve the whole world, right? It's not a, um, a egocentric type of thrust, okay? And then he provides us with, you know, um, with this four, you know, key components or interventions in history. He says one, well, he says the most effective means of intervention is struggle in various forms. In fact, the motive force and fundamental shape of history is struggle. Thus, to make history, humans must struggle with four major challenges, nature, society, other humans, and their immediate selves, right? So these are the four things that the human must go up against to make history, right? Nature, the society at large, other human beings, and then themselves, right? And um, I don't know if he has these in a particular order, right? But I think it's interesting to see, you know, does one take a precedent of the, over the other, right? So can you, um, could you really master nature if you haven't mastered yourself? Or could you master yourself without mastering nature? Right. So and this is why I say I don't know if there's a particular order to this, but I think it will be a good intellectual project or a good question that could birth your paper. Right. So Karenga offers us four components that humans must deal with in order to um, make history. Those four components are nature, society, other humans, and their immediate selves. This paper will deal with the question: are these components in order? or does it not matter, right? So this is like an example of a question that you could use that will serve as a paper. All right. So for those who have um, been through all the, the, the course lectures, we know, 
and I provide sufficient evidence that humanity starts in Africa, right? Um, I use the example of Abiyomi. I mentioned that the oldest African remains have, can be traced back um, anywhere from 3.5 to 8 million years old. Um, I also said that the real answer to how old African people are is unknown because the digger that they de the deeper that they dig, the older African peoples can be, right? Um, Karenga also picks up this project, right? He says that all evidence suggests that the African continent was the first and indeed the principal center of human development. Evidence suggests that various lines of hominin, human subspecies, and humans originated in and later migrate from Africa to other parts of the world. Thus, all links in the chain relating us to the earliest hominids and, and pre-hominins are to be found in Africa, right? So in other words, all of humanity comes out of Africa. Has anybody heard of the mitochondria DNA? Does that sound familiar to anyone? Mitochondrial DNA. So the mitochondria DNA is a DNA strand that all human species hold, right? And that DNA strand can be traced directly back to the black woman. Because think about this, if history, if history says that humanity originated in Africa, if science says humanity originated in Africa, right? Who gives birth? Women do, right? So one could argue if, that's the, if that is the case, the first woman to give birth to us all would be a black woman, right? And this is supported by the mitochondria DNA. The black woman holds this DNA strand within their being, right? And again, it's sparsed out to everyone on the planet, which to me is another evidence that supports the claim that Karanga is making far as Africa being the birthplace, birthplace of humanity. Um, I'm not going to go into all of the civilizations. Uh, I'm going to kind of kind of breeze through those. Um, so probably the most recognized um, historic African civilization would be Kimmy. I'm sorry. I, I have a quick question about the um, DNA. Uh -huh. um, was, is that um, like linked to, to like the African woman DNA? Absolutely. I asked because an anthropology is just I was going to answer before you said, um, as a, the DNA that comes from your mother. Yep. And okay. so that DNA that comes from your mother is also that, like that DNA strand is strongest in black women because one would argue that's the original mother. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, so the uh, it's widely recognized and understood, right, that the the, the original civilization is is Egypt, right? But if you notice, I don't say Egypt, I say Kemet. Um, for those who have been in the course before, what does Kemet mean? What is the etymology of the term Kemet? Land of the Blacks. Thank you. So the etymology, and the etymology simply means like the origin, the historical origin or definition, right? By definition, the term Kemet means land of the Blacks, right? Kim, the root word of Kemet, Kim, means Black. Right? So chemistry, chem, same root word, right? So chemistry would be, the etymology would be the study of what? If the root word is chem, and we know that chem it is the land of the blacks, the root word is chem and chemistry, stri is the study of, right? So what is the chem and chemistry indicative of? The study of blacks? Yep. So the etymology of chemistry, again, using this root word chem, is the study of blackness, right? So again, this idea of chemit being the original society, the original developed society where you get your science, where you'll get your mathematics, right? Where you'll get um, the science of surgeries, right? Science of architecture, right? That was really birthed through a society called Nubia, right? And Nubia was a society directly south of Kemet. And they had all of this information. And that information migrated north and produced this robust society that we know called Kemet. 
Going to page 73 in the text, it says Nubia. It was once argued that Nubia had no civilization, which Egypt, her northern neighbor, did not give her, right? So this is saying that Nubia got all of this information from Kemet, right? But modern scholarship affirms an indigenous civilization in Nubia that was not only as old, if not older than Egypt itself, but also was a rival equal and ruler of Egypt at various times, right? And what you would know throughout history, um, this text here, it's called The Destruction of Black Civilization, Great Issues of the Race from 50, sorry, 4500 BC to 2000 AD, right? This text provides a great historical overview of how power would be bouncing back and forth between Nubia and Egypt or Kemet. And what happens is as the European invaders would come in to take over Kemet, it would be Nubia, the black rulers in Nubia who would come back to take over that area and make it a, a, a back to a black land, right? And that would be the rival that Karenga is talking about as they would jockey for power in that portion of Africa. So Nubia, I, I do wanna point out because it could be argued that there is no Egypt, there is no Kemet without Nubia, right? Um, you know what, I think I'm gonna, yeah, I'll, I'll end it there for sake of time. Um, and I'll go into the second half of black history next week, okay? So we'll, we'll put that, a pause on that for now, and then we'll pick up where, um, and it's gonna kind of go into what Patricia was talking about to start us off in regards to the African presence in the Americas. Um, any questions, comments, or concerns about what we've heard so far as it pertains to the reading material? Anything stood out? Anything fucked you up? Anything you say, yo, professor, that's bullshit, bro. I got some different information. We can talk about that too. You don't have to believe what I say, right? I would rather you be critical and cross-reference my information just than you just believe me because I say so. If you take Patricia's example earlier in the class, right, her professor told her a lie. So we can, as professors, be liars, right? So I encourage you always to be critical about the information that you engage, even if it's from me, especially if it's coming from me. Because I'm opening, I'm open to intellectual discourse and dialogue. Um, so thoughts about the material. I have one. Um, it was about because I, I work full time at a hospital, so that's why I wasn't here last week. But I did a study on um, the DNA samples and stuff, and that's why I do know about that. But there's a lot of people in the hospital that don't believe. They have any type of any other race other than, I'm just going to say white. Mm -hmm. And I literally, this patient fired me because I was trying to explain how the DNA does not ex like show. I was like, you have this DNA in you. She was like, no, you're lying. She thought I made something up and with the government and all this. And I was like, you know what? I'm not in the mood for this. I told my manager, I'm walking out. I can't do this. And because people just don't understand that they get it from the history and not only that with the blood work all that doesn't lie but you know people they don't they don't believe it which it amazes me how people in their mind just are stick to one ways yeah and, and then also that's that's right excuse me like think about this um so you have like your ancestry.com and things of that nature right mm. most yeah. people when you get that red it's not gonna come back 100 percent european it's just not how that yeah. should work right even if i were to get my ancestry red as black as i am right i'm gonna have some elements of european into my into my ancestry that's just, mm -hmm. that's just what it is right because there's a couple of things that happen um one there's this thing called rape <laughs> right mm -hmm especially on a plantation system where someone could take advantage and impregnate someone at their whim, that's gonna cause for a mixing and a matching of DNA and different type of blood samples, right? Um, two, folks migrate, folks travel and folks have sex, right? Which is gonna cause the DNA to be mixed. So this idea of a pure blood, right? What is, does that sound familiar to you? I'm a pure-blooded American, I'm a poor, pure-blooded European. Where, where does that language come from? Where does that, historically, where do you think, where can you trace that back to? I want to say whites. Whites, yes, absolutely. But there's a historical rupture, there's a historical moment that kind of produces this idea of white purity. No one, no one, sound familiar? The Nazis, right? 
this idea of a pure white race, this pure Anglo race, this is a Nazi idea, right? And quiet as kept, if you read Hitler's diaries, Hitler learned his racism from where? Who did he study? Nobody read Mein Kampf? He studied America. Hitler learned from America how to be racist. So it's not happenstance when you see Desiree's example of people wanting to cling to this idea of pure whiteness. It provides you social capital in a white supremacist society. Does that make sense? Does anybody understand what social capital is? Anyone not understand what social capital is? I do have a comment. Go ahead. Um, okay. I'm from Egypt, okay? Okay. Yeah, so uh, um, I think Hitler didn't learn it from the American. It's huh? from Hitler didn't learn the racism from the American. Okay. But it was from the European because from the old time, uh, Europe was the main uh, core for the racism. When they began their uh, fights under the Christianity, uh, that was the beginning of the racism. And whenever they looked for any other nation, uh, they used to um, look by, uh, by uh, like they are less than, than us, they are different than us. Their racism was from the European, from the first point. I, I'm not- I But I think, that, I think that more in, in the modern time though, um, he looked at the colonization of, the, of America and how white people came here and just took over. So I, yeah, I think that maybe it was more of a, of, of a more recent time than, I mean, than back to the. the and, and if I could the, add, uh, if I could add, Pat, Patricia, um, think about it, historical context, Maggie. Okay, so when you're talking about this European um, proliferation of, of, of what we could call white supremacy, right? One of the things with Europe. And one of the reasons why racism in Europe looks a lot different, right? Europe was involved in what, as Patricia says, colonization, right? Does everyone understand how colonization works? So you're gonna go outside of your home into someone else's home and take that home over, right? This is the idea of colonization, right? This is very different from American racism where you exported African people to your home, right? So where's the two difference between colonization in American racism. And I'm, just for sake of time, I'm gonna lay it out flat for you. Colonization, you don't have to deal with the black folks living amongst you because you're going to fuck up their home, right? To so whereas American racism, their biggest problem was, okay, when we wanna end this project of racism, we still have to live amongst the blacks, right? So America had to come up with an institution to separate one group of people from another group of people. We called it Jim Crow, we called it segregation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Hitler was able to study the process of how to treat and socialize people differently from the American project, right? Because by and large, Europe didn't have the problem of black folks, of indigenous folks living amongst the Europeans because they went outside of the country to do their dirt. Right, where the Americans, they, for, for lack of a better terminology, they shat where they sleep, right? They took a shit where they sleep at. So now they have to deal with the issue of what do we do with these black folks that are amongst our, our social, social society, right? This is the whole concept and the idea around the reconstruction era. How do we reconstruct the nation to have it to where it's uh, comparable for both parties, right? Which was a failed project. Um, but again, I, I, not to say that you're wrong, Maggie, because you're absolutely right. The idea of manifest destiny, um, the papal bull, right? The, 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 the creed that the Pope Nicholas V signed that allowed Europe to go out to Africa and start to capture people and push them into enslavement, that's directly a European project, right? But to Patricia's point, the process of socializing a group to be different, that's a distinctly American phenomenon. Um, other thoughts about the information? Let's get two more comments and we'll move into um, the prompts. George, what you thinking, man? I see you. I see them wheels turning, homie. What's on your mind? 
Uh, hey, Professor uh, Amiri, uh, nice to meet you guys. And uh, yes, I wanted to cut my uh, my attention about the Danazis. I think the Danazis, you know, like he is uh, he's in a white. But the most uh, significant point is he was racist against the Jews because the Jewish at that time during uh, the World War I, uh, they took places as one unit. So for one unit, he wanted to mimic that uh, small culture, how they all were together, even in a small party, but they have the most powerful economic uh, uh, points in that, at that time. Uh, that's why for the World War II, you know, the Hitlers, you know, like he took the uh, action against them to stop him. Uh, Hitler, what he mentioned in his book, you know, like he was a very strict uh, uh, religious person as like a Catholic or something. So he thought that uh, by eliminate the Jews, which is they were took off the money, the they even they encourage people to do some adulteries, which is again is the, the Christianity. So he got this hate, he got this uh, genocide mind that he wanted to get away from those uh, Jewish, uh, even though they, you know, like they were from the because um, they took in the Bible or they took in the old testimonies, you know, as a supportive. Oh, we are the uh, chosen people from the Lord. And he looked at them like that. Hey, guys, when you don't do it, that's what you're supposed to do. He saw, like, that's why they're working under the table or something. So he wanted to get uh, eliminated. Them. And then he started to took over all the countries around it, uh, which are most European and white too. So he was fighting whites. Uh, so in that point, I think he is, um, his hate for the Jewish is the most... Uh, Powerful point, and he wanted to take the same replicate that uh, example to be one union together with one thought. So this is with it, you can conquer all the world. So he took that point and he started to uh, do his war. And uh, this is my opinion about it. Uh, now, thank you. I agree. Thank you, George. Um, so let me do this. Let me kind of talk about the essays. Um, and, and then we'll address any questions that you all ha may have about the essays. Um, so we have three, sorry, two essay prompts, right? Prompt one and essay prompt two. Essay prompt one is very simple, it's very straightforward. Um, all I'm looking for is the question or the problem that will drive the essay, right? And, and, and I gave you an example of it, but another example, right? Um, let's see. Let me see. So in, um, in Black Studies, right, Karanga articulates the importance of the activist intellectual. So the question, this is an example, right? So for example, the question that will drive my essay, why is the activist intellectual important for Black Studies and why not other disciplines seek to utilize the intersection of the activist and the intellectual, right? So that's the question. So now my essay will be about investigating and answering that question, right? So prompt one is only the question. Now think about your journals, right? I have you, ha I have you state four components of your journals, right? The thesis of the reading, the analysis of the reading, the contemporary analysis of the reading, and then the question, right? The reason I have you all use the question point and so that way you have a list of questions that you could turn into your paper, right? So it's like one act leads into the next act. So it shouldn't be um, too difficult for you to come up with questions because you should have been developing questions throughout the whole semester, right? Um, also think about your discussion boards. What are you posting to your discussion boards? The questions that you have in your journals, correct? So it's logical that the questions that you post in your discussion boards could very well be your paper. Right? So essay prompt one is the question or the problem that drives your essay. So I gave you an example of a of question, right? Why is the activist intellectual important in black studies? That's the question, right? A problem could be, why is the problem of police brutality so proliferated through the black community, right? So that's a problem that impacts the black community that you could write an essay about. 
So there's two things that I'm looking for, either a question that involves the discipline of black studies or involves black people as a whole, right? It could be a question about either or, or two, a problem that involves black studies or a problem that involves the black community as a whole, i.e. police brutality, right? So does everyone understand what I'm looking for in essay prompt one? Does anyone not understand what I'm looking for, for in essay prompt one? And it can be as simple as a one sentence question. Why is the activist intellectual important in black studies? Submit that for essay prompt one, you've got full credit, okay? Um, is there anyone who is not familiar with the term an abstract? When you're writing a paper, you have an abstract. Does anyone not know what an abstract is? Okay, thank you, Derek. So an, um, an abstract, has anybody been on like Just Store or like your campus library like, and, and kind of gone through like the digital files of journals that they may have? So if you'll notice on Just Store, you'll have the name of the article, right? And then like a brief paragraph kind of explaining what the article is about. So that way, you know, do I want to read this or not? That brief paragraph is your abstract, right? Another way to think about this, you have a full motion picture, right? Full length motion picture, about a two hour movie, right? But what the uh, producer of the movie will do to make you see if you want to watch it or not, they'll do what? Give you a trailer, right? So your trailer is like a little five minute snippet of the movie to make you interested in the movie. Your abstract is the trailer. Your paper is the full feature length movie. Does, does that make sense? So the abstract is just gonna get the readers kind of engaged and interested to see if this is what they wanna read or if this is something that they find interesting. Um, abstract is a, is a paragraph, right? Five to seven sentences explaining, explaining your problem or your question, the methodologies that you will use to address or answer the question and any possible um, guesses as to what solutions there may be, right? That's what I'm looking for in your abstract. A statement of the question or the problem, the methodology that will be employed to address the questions or the problems, and your possible um, hypothesis as to what the resolutions will be, okay? And then the final um, essay three is just your essay, right? Um, don't get caught up with what it says on the syllabus. I have to put those criteria on there for the class to get registered, right? All I'm looking for is from four to five pages. That's it. Um, I don't care what format that you do, but be consistent with the format. So if you're gonna use MLA, use MLA throughout the whole paper. If you're gonna use APA, use APA throughout the whole paper. If you're gonna use Chicago, use Chicago throughout the whole paper, right? Um, I'm not looking for a published ready paper. I'm not looking for a, a perfect paper. What I'm looking for you to do is work through that problem. You gave me your problem in essay prop one, make sure that the remainder of that paper sticks to working through that problem. And that's gonna determine how your grade will be, right? You can have a perfectly written paper with no grammatical or structural errors. And if you don't stick to the problem, you're not gonna receive a, a good grade, right? You can have a paper that's written, okay, you have some mistakes grammatically and, and structurally, but if you're working through that problem, that's gonna give you a, a good grade. The reason why I'm doing that, um, for those who are interested in going to grad school, that's what they're looking for in papers, right? They want you to work through a problem. Uh, I'm currently earning my PhD at Claremont Graduate University. I'm, what I try to do is the things that I struggle with going from my master's to my PhD program, I wanna make sure that the students that I engage don't have those same struggles, right? And so this is a practice to get you all comfortable with the methodology of developing and crafting a good graduate level paper. And this is why I'm doing it the way that we're doing it, okay? So I'm not looking for it to be grammatically correct. I mean, you know, don't, don't bullshit me, right? Like try to do as best you can, but I'm more concerned with you working through the problem. Um, so that's essay prompt one is your question or your problem. Essay prompt two is your abstract. And essay prompt three is the four to five page essay. Does anyone feel unclear, uncertain, or need me to elucidate a little bit more about the paper? The, the abstract corresponds with the prompt one, correct? Correct. So, 
So prompt one is the question, and you're going to just kind of elaborate a little bit more in the abstract about the, the question. Um, I, I could post a, a, a copy of the abstract. I just don't know if it will further confuse you all or not, but, but I'll do it. I'll, I'll, I'll post an abstract that I um, submitted for one of my papers. You guys could use that as an example. Um, so that way you'll have that. Does, does that make a little more sense to you though, Derek? Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, um, so we have a choice to choose either essay uh, prompt one, two, or three, correct? No, you have to do prop one, prop two, prompt and two. Three. Okay, okay. Any other questions? Um, I had one. Mm -hmm. So how you said like how the first one for like our first essay, you, um, we could do, let's just say we're doing APA formatting, we do everything and then we just figure out the problem. Do you still want us to continue or is it just like that, it's fine and then we send it in? Yeah, so so for, I believe if I'm not mistaken, essay prompt one is due on the 20th. Um, so all I'm looking for is you to say, my question is this. That's it. Boom. One sentence. And that's cool. Or the problem that I'll be dealing with is this. Boom. And that, that'll get you your grade for essay prompt one. Right. And then I believe um, they might be doing the same time. I'll, I'll have to double check that. But let's just say the 21st. Right. The um, abstract is due. So what you're going to say. So in prompt one, my question was my problem is police brutality. In my abstract, I'm dealing with a problem of police brutality. I'll be using critical analysis as the methodology to understand the problem of police brutality. I anticipate um, having more questions and answers through this research, right? And that's what you're going to state in your abstract. And that will be your abstract for um, the essay prompt two. And then the final submission will be the actual essay itself. Does that make sense, Desiree? Yes. And then another thing I was going to ask if I could use this as working in the medical field, I know a lot of, I know police, police brutality is a big one, but I was going to see if this was okay. A lot of people probably think African-Americans, people of culture have a higher pain tolerance than whites. And I've seen it so many times they come in, they're like, oh, they just want drugs. I'm like, you don't know that. And then next thing you know, the patient is like, needs abdominal surgery. And I'm like, but this white person over here is with having a full drug withdrawal and you guys are giving them more attention than yep. you know the people of color so i was gonna know if that's also okay as well that's to do. perfectly that's perfectly fine the okay. only thing is um my my only question would be i don't know in the text if there's any source material for that yeah. right so that, okay. that may make it a little bit more difficult for you um but i'm okay because i to be, to be honest with you desiree so like right now we're in like the DEI moment, right? If you're paying attention, mm -hmm. all these companies are doing diversity, equity, and inclusion. The next thing that's gonna come up is gonna be disparity in healthcare. So you're really, you're on to the next wave of racial inequality. So you're, you're, you're spot on. My only thing is like, where are you gonna find those source materials? That would be my only Got question. Um, mm -hmm. And I would suggest for everyone, if, if you pick from topics that are in the book, you already have your source material, right? And you don't have to look for a lot of outside sources. But anything that's dealing with the discipline of Pan African, sorry, Black and Africana studies, or dealing with the Black and African community is acceptable to me. But I need you to have a good like source material, right? I don't like like uh, Wikipedia and shit like that. That don't count. I need, I need like real solid academic textbooks, right? Um, any other questions? Let me ask you all this. Oh, go, go ahead, Derek. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, we're not limited to only using modern day um, conflicts. We could use, say, for example, material from the pre-Kerma. Kerma, we could talk about certain things like that? Yep. Okay. I mean, we just read on African history, right? So we, we know how important history is. So I wouldn't, you know, negate using historical information. That's definitely acceptable. Okay. Thank you. Um, my question for you all, how do you now feel about the final essay? Is that, am I asking too much? Is it cool, a little bit better? I see George Nine is here, I see Desiree give me a thumbs up. Anybody nervous or saying, yo, you fucking tripping professor, this is too much. You speak on that too. Hi, I just have a question. Okay. I, I, um, I understand now, um, essay one and essay two, like number one is just the question and number two is the abstract, like, um, you know, you gotta motivate like the trailer or however, and then the essay, the essay, um, three to five pages. I just, I, I don't want to feel like I'm, um, like, 
I haven't wrote a paper in a long time. So I just, um, if, is it okay if we like, um, like we read some of the, um, some of the readings from the book and then we like, um, we, we word it ourselves, but I mean, I can get the quote, like I can put it in parentheses, like that's fine. Like just, you know, yeah, define so that. That's, that's a quote. I, 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 I don't know your name because the, uh, there's no title on oh, this. But, Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie. Yeah. So, so really Stephanie, that's a question of citations, right? And, and, and to me, there's two ways you can go about the citation. You could rephrase it into your own words, but that also like, you have to be very careful because you don't want to fall into the idea of plagiarism, right? But if you, let's just say, I don't know, for me, I like Chicago format, right? And let's just say you're going to pull from this quote from the book. You put a little uh, number at the end of that quote. And then on the bottom of your page, you put the citation. So this is from Introduction to Black Studies by Malala Karanga, published in 2005, yada, 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 right? And that's the way that you could use the information from the book without being plagiarized, right? And then it will be about not rephrasing what's already been said, but putting your analysis on what's been said, right? Because if you think about um, your journals, the first thing I ask you for is your thesis. So what is the overall argument of the reading? And I ask you for your analysis, like how did you make sense of the reading? So really, if you're gonna use a passage, it's not gonna be about restating what's already been said, it's gonna be about uh, adding your understanding, your analysis, how this applies to the project that you're working on to support that passage. Does that make sense? Yes, it does, I understand it, yes. Any other questions? Okay. Um, actually, I, I do want to offer one thing to you. Actually, I, I want to give you all an extra credit opportunity um, for tomorrow. Um, I will be doing a lecture with um, the Black Africana Studies Department here at Cerritos on Juneteenth. Um, let me try to pull up, pull up the... This, I, I'll post, it's at one o'clock, tomorrow is on Zoom. I will post a flyer to our um, Canvas site. And then if you guys attend and you do a journal entry, um, that will give you some extra credit, okay? Um, and, I, and I'll make an announcement to the overall class so everyone knows that it's tomorrow at 1 p.m. It's via Zoom. Um, it will be myself and Dr. Narly, Dr. Natalie Sarton, excuse me. She is the chair of the Black Africana Studies Department here in Cerritos. Um, so that will be an extra credit opportunity if you so choose. Um, anything else, you always can shoot me an email um, or, or a Canvas message, and, and I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. Um, we could also set up like a one-on-one -on -one Zoom session if need be, if you have questions about your paper, or if you kind of want to get pointed in the right direction as far as resources. Um, Desiree, if you want to talk about some optional um, resources that you may have for your particular project, um, we could do that as well. Um, so yeah, we're getting close to the end of the semester, man, so, so use me as a resource um and start really thinking about these paper topics and, and problems that you find of interest right and we'll go from there any other questions comments or concerns uh Desiree go ahead you, you're on mute yeah sorry um so if, when we went into our like little groups I just wanted to clarify so like for week three our like journal I know we have to read certain, like I think three different parts is it every single one a different one or just one for good, the whole good, time. That's, a, that's a good question, that's right. No, so like just one journal for that section, right? So like we have um, Black Our Story section one in the module. So that's just one journal entry for all the reading in that section. Then we have Black Our Story Continued for the following module, right? That's one journal entry for all the readings in that one section. So don't, um, yeah, so do like a, a, a journal entry per module. Does that answer your question more concisely? Yeah, okay. And I would also argue or also suggest go through the modules to kind of see what's expected and what's due. That's the clearest and the concisest way to know what's coming up next. Any other questions? Will you have examples to help people out in case they need assistance with their essays? For example, yeah, I'll put, abstract yeah, I'll put, uh, I'll put a, a example question or problem and then I'll put up an example abstract as well so you, you guys will have those. But I just, um, but please, if there's questions about my abstract or something like that, let me know because I don't want that to be more confusing or more make it more opaque, right? Like, please, if you have questions, let me know. Any other questions? Um, next week, we'll go back to the 11 to 12, 15 time. I, I had a parent-teacher conference with my son's school, so that's why I had to push things back a little bit. Um, but next week, we'll, we'll be at 11 o'clock to 12, 15. And now we'll try to keep that schedule um, for the rest of the time that we have together. 
Um, other than that, if you don't have any other questions, be well, be healthy, be wise, get some exercise, get some water, get some vitamin D. I will see you all next week. Peace. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Thank you. You're welcome. George, you good? You have any questions? No, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you have a good one, man. You're welcome. You too. Thank you. Bye. Bye.